are live. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, from the Ancient Future Studios somewhere in Australia. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the world premiere of Spotlight On, the brand new Aberdot TV production. We have waiting in the wings one of the greatest creators and illusionists of all time. Uh, it's absolutely, this is like totally stoked. Now, I first saw this gentleman perform at the Magic Castle over 30 years ago and was blown away. Just the creation, the innovation, the, just the complete originality that he showed. So to me, it's no surprise whatsoever that he's gone on to just extraordinary heights. And in many ways, the, the word great in magic, we know it's overused. Anyone's a great magician. But uh, it, it's just a pleasure and an honor to introduce someone who I think has defined the standard by which any, anyone can call themselves great. So please welcome the one, the only, Mr. Franz Harari. Dude. Hey, Jay. <laughs> wow, what an introduction. Honestly, I don't think I can, uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to live up to that. <sighs> by by the way, by the, by the way, and this is the truth. Um, everything you said about me, I feel the same about you because you and I, we're at a place in our careers where we have guys coming up, middle-aged guys coming up saying, you know, I grew up watching you on TV. You get this, right? <laughs> when I was starting out, when I was like, you know, 13, 14 years old, I was watching you on TV. I wanted to be you. So Ooh. you you are that guy to me. <laughs> I got doves. I got doves. I got the whole thing. Uh, yep. Wow. I no, was ready. I, that, that, I didn't know that, Franz and everyone else. I had, yep. That was a, the first original break. We, we're going to have a lot of uh, revelations. That was the un it, <laughs> surprise. This feels me. like a, a group therapy thing. Yeah, that's it. I love this. Yeah. Look, the idea here is that this is going to be not so much hype as really a talk uh, behind the myth, beneath the, the facade. And Franz is hanging out, I believe. You're hanging out in a... a, a I am. In I'm, you're in your car I, in Vegas, yes? I was. I thought, I, I forgot that I need to be in Vegas today. So I thought, all right, I'm going to get up early. I'm going to hit the road and I'm going to get uh, right over it. You know, I can show you better. Let me put the top down. Um, yeah, dude, let's see. I got to turn my car on. Um, I thought I could make it to the hotel and get checked in in time for this. And I came real, real close, but not all the way. So uh, hold on. Let me see if I can. I'm doing this with one. I'm, I'm pressing the button with one hand on my car and uh, holding the phone with the other hand. So there's a little bit of a thing going on. But uh, hold on. Now I can show you the Rio. The Rio. And to give you a, yes. a point of view, there's the Rio, there's um, the Bellagio, and so you kind of see the Luxor. That's sort of where we are. Let me turn my radio off. And so I am in the top of a parking lot in a Rio adjacent hotel. And I figured I would just be here and, and, and do this. And then when it's all done, I will go over to the Bellagio and check in, and we're done. So. So close. I was almost doing this from a hoity toity hotel room. So close. But instead, you get to hear my car. So. I actually like the, uh, the, the spontaneity and the, the, the true, you know, the improvisational aspect of, of where right. you are. That, yeah, that's you know, right. come on. We're, we're pros. We're bomb proof, right? <laughs> that's, uh, that's it. That's it. We've, we've been through so much. Nothing rattles us anymore. It's true. The show must go on. It's true. Okay, well, look, we are going to go from the past to the present and on into the future, everyone. And I'm going to start this off, and this is this is about all about Franz. So, but I'm going to start off with a single photo. And as we go, I'm going to ask you, Franz. I'm going to ask you to sort of talk about this. Okay, so here we go. We're going to go take the way back machine. We're going to take the way back machine. The this way back. It. There's a reference. The way back. Aye, aye. Wow, wow. Well, that's a whole bunch of photos there. All right. I guess we'll start on the left. So. So the idea is I'm telling you what we're looking at here. Okay. Well, the yeah, sure. Anything. The talk left talk is the left is my best attempt to take my own first promo shot. So I got the jacket that my mom put, uh, uh, you know, she put the rhinestones on. 
And let me get real close. Oh, I was one. That's my dove. That's my J. Scott Berry dove right there. So I, 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 uh, I uh, taped up a bed sheet in my bedroom and I even sprayed on uh, Magic and Illusion, which would then become Odyssey and Illusion. And uh, I tried my best. That's as close as I came. Moving over like to the, the right. I like the spray paint. The spray That's paint it. to me is the most and, impressive thing And by thing the way, you know, you can still do that now. And it's, uh, it's, it's um, what the kids like to call hip hop. So it kind of works again. Uh, going the over first. to the, yeah, going over one more. That's my actual first shot. That was my high school, I think, sophomore or junior, I think sophomore picture. You know, when you get your picture taken to school. So I thought, all right, I'm, I'm going to capitalize on this. I'm going to make the most of this and, and get a picture taken like every other magician I'd ever seen with a zombie ball. So then going over, that's uh, one of the first shows I ever did for a, a, a art fair, the Ann Arbor Art Fair, uh, with my zigzag that I built by myself from the Harbin book that um, I bought. It cost 100 bucks, and back then, that might as well have been $10,000. But I got it, I bought it, I built the zigzag, and, 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 and I actually built about 30 other illusions, kind of standard stuff, but it taught me how to, uh, you know, it taught me ba basic carpentry and, you know, and a little bit of engineering. Finally, uh, I made it out to the Magic Castle in 1983 because I uh, was doing magic for the, uh, the Rose Bowl. I was doing, I was always doing in, in uh, by this time, I guess, how would this have been? I guess I would have been in, college by then and i was doing uh, magic designing magic for the university of michigan marching band so when they went to the rose bowl so did i so that i could go there and make a girl float in the middle of the uh, the field but while i was there i was also determined to go to the magic castle unfortunately i was 20 i wasn't getting in but i brought my costume so that i could take the picture and say that i ron serrari had performed at the magic castle even though it was basically a mouth coils in a parking lot <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> we all have pictures. I mean, we all have our own. <laughs> we, I think, do you have that somewhat, picture? Did you take that? Somewhat embarrassing to look at now, but nevertheless, it's part of history. I had to search yeah. for that Magic Castle one. <laughs> I had to actually really do we it. We all deep. took it. We all wanted Google to be search. Mark Wilson. All of us wanted to be Mark Wilson floating Nani sure in the did. parking lot right there. Oh, man. So, well, thank you for that. So you grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We'll sort of pick up I from did. there. Yep. Yes. Ann Arbor, uh, University of Michigan. That's really where I kind of, for well, one, figured out that I wanted to be a magician. Oh, my God, my hair is terrible. Look at this. So get it. There, now it's, it's perfect. So it Come wasn't on. right before, but now it's perfect. <laughs> you know? So... Uh, yeah, so I went to school at Eastern Michigan University, but I did everything that I'm proud of at the University of Michigan with the Michigan Marching Band, the Opera Department, the Theater Department, the Orchestra. Uh, and I was able to convince all these groups into basically letting me experiment with them. So I was studying music. Um, I had a scholarship to be a singer. I thought I was going to go to Broadway and be that guy. But as I was studying, I was also inventing magic. So I, I convinced the University of Michigan uh, Orchestra to letting me guest conduct them. And of course, while I'm doing it, I float in the air and make the violinist disappear and all that stuff. Same thing with the U of M marching band, where I really, purely out of necessity, figured out uh, ways to do magic, uh, surrounded 360 in the daylight for a football audience that doesn't want to see magic, by the way. The last thing they want to see is an illusion they just want to get back to the game but i i through necessity taught myself a couple of formulas that i still use to this day uh, including making a car appear um out in a parking lot uh, which by the way i since i'd sold to copperfield and kevin james and a bunch of other people so a lot of the stuff that i was working out in college because i had no other choice i continue to use even now you know 40 years later something like that into my professional life. Amazing. That, yeah, I just, and that's what I was impressed when I first saw you, is that, that you had this, it, it was a, a sheer chutzpah, if you will. I mean, that's it. a lot of magicians, by the time I, again, by the time I first saw you perform, a lot of magicians were following others, but you clearly were already blazing your own trail. The illusions you, I saw you do were like, wow, I've never seen that before. 
And it's great, as you say, that you started with the, the Harbin, and then you built it. Right. That, to me, is the right. most impressive thing you well, say, you know? <laughs> you know, right off the bat, even when I was building my zigzag, right off the start, I knew that I wanted to do my own stuff. It's And I, I have no problem with guys doing cube zags and interludes and all that power to them. In fact, keep doing it because you buy stuff from me, and, you know, that's a living. But um, for myself personally, I never found it rewarding. I always felt as though I'm like a karaoke singer singing somebody else's stuff. So even before I knew what I was doing, I was determined to do my own thing because I felt like if, even if it wasn't good and even if I was kind of making it up as I go along, if I could do something new, if I could do my own thing, then I felt like that's what art is. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd always kind of come from that philosophy, even before I discovered magic, that if, if you're if you're copying somebody else that's fine you know but that makes you a craftsman and and, and magic is an art and so it should it should reflect who you are and it should tell a little bit about yourself and you know as an adult i can look back i didn't i didn't analyze it as much when i was in college you know back then but really that's what what drove all this and at the same time i can say back then and even today there is such great reward in creating something that didn't exist before, putting it out there, hoping it doesn't blow up, and assuming it's somewhat successful, seeing that uh, reaction that you get from others. Because when you get that reaction, you, they're not just applauding you or they're not just celebrating you know, your performance. What they're doing is saying they approve of and they have been uh, affected, arguably emotionally affected, by your vision and your your creation, and that makes it so much more personal and so much rewarding. Uh, so, again, uh, on a side note, this has sort of been my mantra for the last thirty years. Speaking to all of the magicians out there that are starting out, great, go ahead and do you know licking rings and all that. Great, learn the craft, learn learn the rudimentary principles of what we do, you know, the, the, the philosophies of this direction. But then once you got it, start figuring out how to use those disciplines to create the next thing, because that is what's going to push magic forward and, uh, and, and make sure that it stays viable as an art form. And, and it doesn't become, you know, making the same donuts every day. Wow. You had me with, I hope it doesn't blow up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So that's still the case, Look, by the way. But you know, let me yeah. say, uh, still, uh, ev everything that I'm doing, even right now here in Vegas, except I can't talk about it yet because of all these, you know, legal stuff that we signed. Anything that I do, uh, I, I always make sure Okay, let, let me back up a little bit. Let, okay, I, I'll just say I always make sure that it's different and hopefully better than anything that I did in the past. And so with that comes risk. So I can say that every production, every project that means anything to me, there's always a little bit of, of risk in there. And I'm never 100% sure if it's going to work. By now, I've been doing it for so long that I've got outs. And I know that if something does fail, I'm going to be able to get around that. I'm going to be able to do a little dance and, and make my way through. And, and the stakes are so high because the budgets on these things are so high now that I can't risk you know hundreds of thousands of dollars from somebody else. So I need to know that even though I'm into new territory, into new lands, that I've always got the ability to jump back. And the worst thing that's gonna happen is I'm gonna do something similar to what I did before. But I always try to use every project as an opportunity to push forward the next thing. So every one of these things, every, every, anytime I do anything worth anything, the first time my butt's clenching just a little bit. Now I'm lying, it's clenching a lot the first time because there's so much riding on it, you know? But then once I did it, ah, I got that. And now I can use that and put that into my toolbox of, of, of um, design philosophies, of, 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 uh, of design formulas, and use that for the next thing. So going back to, going back to, and, and I started getting to something else, 
all of this comes from the fact that yeah yeah okay how do i compress this story this is like a half hour story i'm gonna take a compress breath, it into like it's good you're I'll good man i'm loving like this look minutes. it's all this is your show right. dude yeah <laughs> i'm an easy guest aren't i you just you just <laughs> trigger me you just hit that button and then just sit back all right so in 19 I'll, i really will compress the story in 1983 michael jackson burned his hair on a Pepsi commercial, 83 or 84, I think 83, Pepsi commercial. I worshiped Michael Jackson like we all did in the 80s. They said the name of his attorney on Entertainment Tonight, which was a big uh, entertainment kind of news show in the States at the time. And I wrote down the name of the attorney and I thought, I am going to contact the attorney and tell them that I want to create magic for Michael Jackson's X tour, which would be the victory tour, which actually came out in 84. So called the attorney, attorney said, nope, I'm not your guy, but he gave me the name of another guy. I called him the same deal. Nah, I'm not the guy, but call this guy. And I kept compiling names until finally I got the right guy. And when I got the right guy who actually ended up being the man uh, production manager working for the record company and blah, blah, blah. By that time I had it down. So I said, my name is Franz Ferrari. I'm an illusion designer from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I've spoken to blah, 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 all these people. And they say that you're the person I want to talk to. So I got in there. I sent him a VHS a video of myself making a car appear for one of the University of Michigan uh, football games, halftime shows. Uh, they saw the video, probably thought to themselves, here's a 20-year-old kid who can probably save a lot of money. Next thing I knew is I was on a plane flying out from Michigan to LA. I met Michael. We were about the same age. We became friends right away. Michael loved magic. I love magic. Uh, and, and, and so I, he hired me to do all the magic for the, vict for the victory tour in 84. And then because of that relationship, everything he did since then, all of his concerts, uh, even designed magic for Neverland Ranch, which is rigged top to bottom, you know, with all kinds of uh, levitation devices and different vanish devices and whoever bought the place is probably still discovering trap doors. So from that, I was then able also to design for, you know, well over a hundred other pop stores, including his sister, Janet Jackson, and then everybody, Run DMC, New Edition, LL Cool J, uh, Cool the Gang, blah, 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 on and all, all the way to Justin Bieber and Missy Elliott. And so you get the idea. Going back to where all this comes to, and here's the key to all this, is I was hanging out with Michael. Uh, this would have been like 1988, 89, 88. And he goes, you know, Franz, you're doing all this magic for me, but don't you miss doing it yourself? And the truth is I did because before this, I was in Michigan doing these halftime shows and, you know, the university, the orchestra and the opera. And I was missing that. And I was, and of course, I was also doing birthday parties and bar mitzvahs and church basements and all that stuff. So I go, yeah, okay. So I took everything that I learned from Michael and the music industry, uh, which had been 80s at the time, and I used those philosophies to uh, put together my first illusion show. So I grew my hair real big. I got the whole the the mustache, the uh, the whole thing, the, le the leather jacket and the metal and the, the rubber shirt. And, and, and I built the illusions and the set to look like a rock concert in 1988, uh, which by the way, if you go to the Vegas strip, there's still a dozen guys using that same look. So yeah. we can talk <laughs> about that, you know? Uh, and so I, uh, and, and that kind of put me back into the game as an illusionist. So here I know I had this kind of parallel career going as a designer producer but also a performer back to my point that started all of this right around 88 um michael out of the blue he kind of paused and looked at me and he goes you know franz whatever you do make sure you do it different and better than anybody before you different and better and i lived with that and that is still my mantra you know and and it's it, it's it's just in my DNA now. So anything that I tackle, first thing is, how can this be different? And how can it be better than what others have done before? So that, that is so deep in 
my way of being. I, it's even hard to explain. I don't even think about it anymore. All right, that was like a 10 minute answer. That I was forgot brilliant. What the question look, was. we're going to pick that but right up because look, I'm, I'm going to say just very couple things. Number one, I totally agree. The whole idea of art to be an artist. Right. And that to me came from Masculine, the Masculine book, Our Magic. Right. And it was all oh, about I remember high it. art. I so from I the masculine. very outset, yes. I realized that you said, With you Doug copy Henning someone cover, else. Right? Doug Henning yeah. on the cover. Yeah. I that remember the, that Yeah, book. that was the shortened version, but that was the key of what you masculine. just said. It was about the high art being, you have to be original. You got to take the risk. And to me, that's again, comes right back to where I saw you as one of the trailblazers who was willing to take the risk. Now, stare with me right here because, right. you know, there's the classic meme on Facebook of, you know, you think you're cool, blah, blah. Well, if you think you're cool, you were, you're never as cool as Franz Harari hanging out ah, there you with go. Alice Cooper. Look at this, that. Oh my I gosh. love this pic. I and that's, <laughs> this, is, this would have been like 86, 85, 86, before I decided to do my own show because I hadn't gotten the Bon Jovi hair yet. You know, I got the mustache, but I didn't get the whole big giant uh, heavy metal hair thing going on. And which, by the way, I took a lot of my look from Alice. You know, uh, if you look at the whole chains and metal and all that, that was what I looked like initially, minus the makeup. Because I think by that time, Jeff McBride was already doing the makeup, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> by, by the way, Alice Cooper, I, I honestly haven't talked to him in years, but working with him, I learned so much. Um, uh, firstly, um, he is a perfectionist. Everything he does, he, he himself is deep into it. And there have been other artists that I've worked with like that, especially Missy Elliott. I don't know if you're familiar with her work, but my gosh. Um, okay, to jump over, I'm in another tangent here. Missy Elliott, I've done over 30 concerts with. So she's done 30 different illusions, which I think is more illusions than most of the magicians here in Vegas. So I'm going to put her in there with one of the most visible illusionists. But any, anyway, going back to Alice Cooper. Man, I'm hey, just Alice all Cooper. over the road here. I am just all over the road. I would not want to be interviewing me right now. So <laughs> what Alice Cooper, what Alice Cooper said was, I remember uh, we were working on something uh, and we were with his production manager and somebody came in and um, I think it was somebody with catering or something. And they had some small little problem about they were out of mayonnaise or something, whatever it was. And so we stopped what we were doing, which was pretty heavy duty at the time because it was deep into the staging of the concert. And suddenly they were dealing with mayonnaise. And when the guy left, I go, how can you, how can you stop everything you're doing and now focus on mayonnaise? And both Alice and his production manager said, you know, you got to figure whoever's coming to you at that moment, whatever issue they have is the most important issue in their lives. And nothing that we're doing is any more important than the guy who ran out of mayonnaise because we're all equal, you know, in this ride, you know? So you've got to respect everybody you're working with and appreciate everything that they're doing, regardless of how important you may think their piece of the puzzle is, you know? And I've lived with that. And, and I've, I've tried my best to live that even when, the, even when everything falls to hell, you got to remember that everybody's got their own lives and they've got their own issues and problems and, no one of them is bigger than any other, you know, and, and we, as you and I are lucky because often we get to stand on stage and, and take credit for the work of 150 people. But the truth being is we are just one more gear in that clock. That's it. You know, and you can remove any one of those gears and it all stops. So we're lucky because we get to reap the rewards and play star, but we're just one more team member. Henceforth to be known as the mystical mayonnaise principle by Franz Harari. That's it. That's yes. It. I have some Write that my, one uh, down in magic right history. Now. The mayonnaise mm -hmm. principle. <laughs> history. We're all, we're all part of the also, sandwich. <laughs> could, have been, could have been ranch dressing. I can't say for sure. Yeah. <laughs> a very long time ago. Oh, man. Okay. Well, we're going to keep moving on on our amazing journey. Thank you. God, wow. That was fantastic. Um, now, uh, this is no particular order, but I'm, gonna, we're gonna, I'm just going to pop some photos because these s stuck out to me. Here we go. This one just cooked me. Now we're going to ah. leap forward, I think, a couple of years, right? <laughs> right. You know, 
So, <laughs> you know, you watching this at home, you should probably know, um, Jay called me literally a few days ago about this. And he sent me some pictures that he found online. And I said, well, hell, if you want more, let me send you more. So I just, I went to my computer and I just grabbed pretty much anything I could. I didn't put a lot of thought into it, but I sent Jay about 200 just random pictures. So I cannot tell you what you're about to see. And there's no particular order or any kind of sensibility to them other than uh, I thought they looked pretty. This is uh, Guangzhou, China, uh, 10 years ago. Um, uh, we did four shows, about 40,000 people per show. Uh, and we actually shot a documentary on it, which you can get from Penguin Magic and Murphy's Magic. But it was, I think, I think it still remains the biggest magic production to date. It was about 12 million bucks worth of uh, technology and, and toys. And, uh, and it was during monsoon season. So everything was wet. Everything rained. Quite exciting. Uh, well, look, I agree. That's, that was one of the prettiest. That was what, as you said, that was, that was just such an extraordinary photo. And the very fact that you were just hanging out as this tiny dot. That's in the it. Middle of That's this, all we ever With the are. background and everything. That's all we are. We're tiny little dots. You know? <laughs> just a piece of, uh, uh, we're, we're just the olive on top of the sandwich. <laughs> That's <laughs> the, it. The, the mayonnaise principle. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, here we go. Now, I really liked this because you like oh. the comic book, Mandrake. Yeah. Tell me about this. Uh, that was in the spirit of whatever you do, do it different and better than anyone else. Now, the truth be told, it doesn't really reflect my product at all. I don't do card tricks and I don't really do a lot of retro right now, but I thought, wouldn't it be cool if? So I did some sketches from, uh, you know, old comic books, kind of Buck Rogers period. And I gave it to uh, Brianne Foyer, who was, well, she's actually uh, my production assistant, but also an artist. And I said, run with this and see where it lands. And I never actually used it for a production because again, it's not really my flavor, but it's in the spirit of experimenting and, and taking risks and seeing where it lands. And I really, really do like this genre. And someday I will do a kind of Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon kind of thing. So this was very much experimental. Yeah, to me, this was, it's, it, it has this, it, this ancient future idea. I mean, on one right. hand, as you say, it looks sort of like the Mandrake kind of comics from right. before we were born. And at the same, then in the other one, you're saying magic of the future. To me, that was really it's, a cool juxtaposition. The style is called Future Past. Future, future past, past, also, also retro tech. So now, now, uh, well, now we consider um, Jules Verne to be retro tech, although at the time he was futuristic. So, but there's a, the cool thing about future past is it never goes out of date because it's already over, you know? So Disney, Walt Disney figured out, Tim Delaney, a good friend of mine, uh, designed the new Tomorrowland at Disneyland. Problem with Disneyland Tomorrowland is it kept looking out of date. No matter how modern they made it look, you know, 15 years later, it looks like an old airport. So Tim came up with the idea, if we go Jules Verne, now we've got this future past thing going and it's always going to be in date because it's already behind, which by the way, led to a, a whole movement called steampunk. Steampunk is also future past and it's yeah. never going to go out of style because it already has, you know, <laughs> it's, it is, it's out of time. Somewhere, right. you know, somewhere right. in between time, uh, right. which is actually a real cool concept. You've applied that to a lot of your more recent shows. Yeah, I, I did. I mean, a, I, boy, we're going to get to a couple of those photos where I uh, it's like let's see really good application his. of that idea. I have produced a place in Macau called House of Magic, which we're was get uh, there. Hold on. So, so that, yeah. all uh, that hey, is. How, dude, we, we, we are so in sync. <laughs> so, so all of that is retro tech. The whole place was um uh you know future past it was steampunk so i love again i love technology and and i love stylized technology so this was a great way to really immerse an audience into that world you know now the next thing i wanted so i did that so now i'm working on another thing that i can't talk about because of that's why i'm here in the first place but um the next thing that i want to do is something called diesel punk and diesel punk is a style that pulls its 
inspiration from the 30s and 40s technology. So it's Art Deco. Uh, if you think of old uh, diesel engines, um, it's it's more rounded. It's it's a it's a whole new flavor, and nobody's done it. So that's my plan. Problem is, rounded shapes don't work well for magic, as you know. So it's much easier to be in an Art Deco world where everything is is horizontal and vertical lines. That's pretty easy. The moment you start getting into these curves and these very kind of organic lines, not so great for magic. But I'm figuring out how to make it work. Oh, uh, Jay, you got to turn your mute oh, off. I see it. I'm if watching the one. I'm that. watching the wrong screen. You got to keep yeah. pushing the boundary. I love that. Yeah. Again, like what we said from the get go, is that you you take the risk, you you blaze the trail. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But either way, right. you learn. Right. You know. Right. And. So here we go. Let's keep moving, dude. That it, is, that is oh, one of the coolest billboards I've ever Kingdom seen. Kingdom of Dreams. That's um, in India. I did a run of shows there for about five months uh, after I had done a TV series. So weird thing about, oh, I should have sent you some pictures. I didn't. So I've had a weird career in that I've kind of taken, I've moved around the planet and I've had celebrity in different parts of the planet at different times. And about 10 years ago, for about five years, I had a crazy amount of celebrity in India. And I, that just sounds like such a douchebag thing to say, but go go online, go find Franz in a mall. No, you, you are the international that. guru so, of magic. I love yeah, that. There's, <laughs> there's no way to talk about this, but that's just sounding like such a dick. So go Google it yourself. But at the height of all of this, these billboards were just all over New Delhi. And, and so there, I captured one of them. Unfortunately, they were too high for me to climb up there. Otherwise, you know, I would have stood right there taking the same pose right next to it, you know. That would have been it, wouldn't it? Now, yeah. I actually really like that whole look. The, the, again, you, looking through, and it's true, it's true. He sent me this gigantic data dump of there you go. posters with all these styles, and it gave me a greater sense of the scope uh, that, that uh, Franz was creating. And to me, the, it went from just this incredible across the board uh, of history right up to, as we say, steampunk, steampunk and all of that. Um, so look, let's, uh, oh, oh, dude, don't lose your head over it or anything. Uh, but I love this as another. I just, so <laughs> that's a thing that I did 20 years ago, 21 years ago uh, for Sony, actually. I had Sony as a sponsor. So they gave me a flat screen TV which was massive at the time. It's much, now to do it would be much easier. Uh, and I came up with this illusion where every time the screen would come up in front of my face, it would change into another face and my face would morph. And then finally my head would disappear and show up on the screen, it was this whole thing. Problem is, it was too soon. Uh, this was in uh, 2000, 2001, and the tech just wasn't there to be able to do what I wanted to do. So it had about a 15% failure rate which is just a little bit too high for me. So um, I, I took it out and then I thought I was gonna work on it and then I just got distracted, but it's in my warehouse and I'll bring it back again sometime. Yeah, again, I, and again, right on that, what they call the bleeding edge, is you push so it's far and you realize edge, that I'm right. dre you were dreaming yeah. up beyond right. the edge of technology before it, full HD screens and everything. Yep. You know, it that, that you was know, the first LCD screens. Exactly, right. looked, they were not it, high res. It looked pretty cool, but when it failed, it failed big. And there was no way out. So it was, I just, I, I noticed every time I got into that chair, my blood pressure would rise and man, it, was, it wasn't worth it, you know. <laughs> okay, well, I'm loving this journey. Here we go. I think, I think, I'm, yeah, now this again, this, now this is more so, recent. Do you have the whole poster? I think, it, did I send you two posters? I, I do have, I just fit this one into uh, the whole, kind of this. Yeah, it's a full poster picture. Well, yeah. it's part of a whole story. So, okay, uh, tell us in, the story. In, nine, in, in 2019, um, I got a gig to produce what would be the next uh, evolution of my House of Magic in Macau. So, a lot of the equipment from that, a lot of new equipment, went to Sanya, China. And there we opened a place uh, that it's got a Chinese name that I can't even pronounce, but the show name was Stars of Magic. And uh, in it was uh, uh, Danny and Stacey Cole, Mickey O'Connor, Rocco, 
uh, Al Bionli, um, Tina from Taiwan, uh, Fabio from Brazil. So basically a bunch of my friends I brought together. And we produced this massive show, um, which was bigger than Macau. I think the, the whole budget for everything was about uh, just shy of 40 million US bucks because it was a, a theater and uh, this whole interactive thing and what have you. So we open up January 4th. And uh, before that, about a week before that, we started hearing rumors about some sort of a virus or something in Northern China, but we didn't worry too much about it. But things started to get more and more weird. So we opened up on January 4th. Uh, we did like three shows, three or four shows. And everything I do, I've got um, my videographer, Marky Li Ying Wu, he's from Taiwan. Uh, he documents everything, everything, every, everything that I do professionally, he's there shooting. So I go right about show number four. I go to Marky and I go, something feels weird about this. Ah, just shoot this show as though this is going to be the last time you ever get to shoot this ever. So he's just running all over the stage, on the stage, on the deck, just getting in everybody's face. And we got the show. And sure enough, as soon as it was done, suddenly a bunch of Chinese officials in their government uh, you know, suits showed up on stage and they're speaking Chinese. And the next thing we hear, we're going to shut the show down. It's like, huh, what? So they said, everybody just off the stage, keep it as it is. You'll come back in a week. So, okay. So we left, it, we left wardrobe and, and props and illusions and everything set ready to do the next show, right? And we figure, well, we got a week off. So my wife and I, go to our home in Tokyo and some of the staff goes to uh, the Philippines and Malaysia and Indonesia. And everybody kind of goes back and does their thing, thinking we'll be back in a week. And then things start getting weird and we're realizing we're not coming back in a week. So now it's about getting 31 people out of China before things get really weird. So uh, my wife, who is also a company manager from our place in Tokyo is now online booking flights to get our team out of china and it's and it now comes to getting them out of china as fast as we can and as it came to the point where as people were driving to the airport flights were getting canceled and and so it really was like the evacuation of, of, of saigon you know so and now it's just get people out of the country so we we had people going to rio and to bali and just anywhere but out of china and then once they got out of China, they could go to their homes. And finally, we got everybody out. So now everybody's out of China, but the show is still frozen in time. It's like Chernobyl, you know? It's everything is still set and ready to go. About eight months later, the, my client said, look, we're dying to death here. We've got this massive investment. We've got to run the show. But I can't get into China, and none of my American crew could get into China. The only people who could be are people from Taiwan, Macau, Hong Kong, and that's it. So I was able to assemble six people, including Marky, my cameraman, Li Ying Wu. And since he had seen the show more than anybody by this time, because he had shot all the shows, it's all right, you're it. You're now the illusionist. So I was hoping you had another that other picture, because there's a second poster of Marky as me. So he is now the Chinese Yeah, well, that me. was the one that Gino, Gino was involved with, Gino right. DeVille. Right, that's it. Exactly. Yeah, so I was, uh, I was in the exactly. wings with all that, obviously watching the, right. uh, as things crashed in China and watching how you were dealing with it under extreme yep. conditions. Uh, right. Uh, uh, just extraordinary. Uh, what? So <laughs> I, I had to reopen the new show, teaching new people with Gino, and I did it all remotely on my WeChat video phone from my office. So every day from four o'clock in the afternoon until six o'clock in the morning, there I am in my underwear trying to direct this totally new group of people, this new crew in China, how to reopen the show, which then ran for a year. And now, as you know, China, COVID has taken another peak again in China. So finally, that show has closed and who knows what's going to happen next. But uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's been quite an adventure and we're not over yet, you know. Look, they, and that's one of the things that uh, I'm using as a, just a catchphrase is navigating the new normal. You know, right. people say, oh, well, when we go back, it's like, there's no going back. 
It's like you say, kind of like steampunk and all that. You know, it's only going forward. It's adapting as we go. You said something the other day, which I uh, I almost want to quote you. I've already quoted you on a handful when we first talked. (laughs) You know, the idea of the survivors. And I'll let you say it. Yeah, well, I think, what did I say? Uh, Oh, well, I'll tell you what I believe. I believe that this is going to be survival of the most creative Exactly. Not necessarily the most talented or most wealthy or connected or anything, but the guys who can figure out, and women, who can figure out how to spin it and reposition it and make it work. So right now, creativity is king. So it's it's going to be interesting where this all lands. Yeah. You know? And that's the, I mean, the idea of the whole survival of the fittest of Darwin is who can adapt right. as effectively right. to the changing conditions. It's not about right. strongest, fastest, as you said, the richest. Right. It's about those who can adapt and and right. cope and deal with it and not give in to all. Come on. we. Uh, another thing right. I love you said that, you know, we all got our asses kicked. And you, you yeah. gave me another great There's line. Stuff. I'm like, cool. <laughs> I am embarrassed that you remember all this. But it, I, I think, all right, I think I said, oh, I remember what I said. There's two kinds of magicians: those that got their asses kicked, and those that are lying about it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wanted much. to get that on I, film. I give that to you. I give Jeez, that. Jeez, that was so great. You know. Okay, okay, we're gonna come back to that. I mean, just sort of we're as we lead on to what you keeping but I want to drop a time, couple more folks. Where Please. are we at for time? I've got my car turned off. I don't know what time it is. How are we for time? Oh, yeah, 20, much- oh, we're good. We got I'm figuring we push it up to an hour at this point. I got a handful of photos and then we'll just roll right. it out and talk uh That's in it. general. We'll roll it out. We'll roll it roll out. Roll it out. Now here yeah. I love this is another one that caught my attention because I want to know who's cheating in this game. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I like to play with myself now and then, you know. <laughs> That's it. That so was tell actually me about John. This. I, I, so this is ahead. John Gaughan. John Gaughan is like my grandfather, not even that, my father in magic. He taught me so much. John Gaughan, illusion designer, um, creator, innovator. Um, there's just not enough that I can say about that man. When I came out, when I came out to do the uh, the Jacksons, the first gig. I hadn't even met him, but I already told Michael and his team, yeah, I work with John Gone. So now I just have to finally meet him and say, hey, help me. So he, he kind of adopted me as his uh, illegitimate child. And, you know, we've been good friends since then. Where I'm going with all this is in his shop a couple of years ago, five years ago, maybe, he had this sequence of mirrors set up as a kind of test. I go, oh, let me take a picture. I got an idea. So that's what this is. Be better if you had a picture of John to tie it all into the story, but left the imagination. <laughs> well, yeah. you had that all. It wasn't the House of Magic? You had sort of these mirrors. You had all sorts everything, of things at that. Everything house. was rigged. A lot of mirror work. Oh man! If you're if you know what a a, a mirror tunnel is, million dollar mystery. Just the whole place was um, within the architecture. I had put a lot of illusion principles so that the magic was hidden within the environment. So everything that happened seemed very germane to the space so that again uh, i didn't totally know if it's going to work because i really kind of went out there and and took a lot of chances but i learned so much from that place so now i know okay well this will work and that'll work and this will work and the biggest thing i learned is that focus is everything you know i had i had stuff in there where audience, you know, just guests would appear and disappear randomly. But if it's not set up effectively, then they miss it. So I realized that even though it's within the architecture, I need to design points of focus within the space to make sure that the audience is aware that, you know, that it's happening. So, so much that I learned from that place that I'm now applying at this next thing we're doing and like that there. Well, I had a friend of mine who came back again right before this would have been November 2019, a friend of mine who had visited Hainan Island. Oh, uh, yeah. And sure, was telling me about show this is. phenomenal show and showing me pictures. Right. And I said, this has to be Franz Harari. I mean, it was such a style. That was that it. it was so much. I just would Franz has to be behind this or someone yeah. copying Franz. There you go. Four performances. <laughs> and that's it. And thank you. And good night. Ah. 
Oh. Yeah. You know, the oh. worst I feel for Al, Al the only. Al the only is a magician uh, yeah, yeah. Out, of, out of Hawaii, formerly Michigan. I've known him for forever since I was a little kid. Um, he, uh, this was the first time he and I ever worked together professionally. And so I kind of dumped him into the deep end. So now his face is all over the city and, you know, he's a star, you know, and I could tell again for me, uh, oh, something else I was talking about for me, I've been doing this now for so long that it's kind of become the norm, but, but throwing Al into all this was like taking your kid to Disneyland for the first time. And I remember watching him enjoy the stardom of it so much that when the thing shut down, the, I think the, the person that I felt for most was Al because I had just given him a taste of what it means to have the world at your feet and then boom, shut it down back to Hawaii. So that was too bad, but we'll find another oh. opportunity. His oh. costumes, all of his costumes are still in China. So there you go. That's promising, you know? Wow. Oh man. Okay. Thank you. We're going to keep moving because I loved this po this photo. There's this next photo. I want to hear the story because the, again, this you've put, there's been so much innovation to me that you've given to the art and the art of illusion and thinking and all this, what we're talking about, the, the, the trailblazing. And here's another one that to me, it, it's like you, to me, I listen, you listen right now to the great composers. You hear Mozart and you get, in, that's Mozart. You hear Beethoven, right. that's Beethoven. I mean, you, you just, hear, boom, it clicks. You hear, to you me, hear, you hear Vivaldi, this is Franz Ferrari. You hear Vivaldi, you hear yeah. Lance, Lance Burton. I think yeah. Lance Burton is Vivaldi. Uh, yeah, that, he's, that is, uh, um, what is that? That was taken in Macau on one of the kind of road shows we did, uh, kind of to test the market. That's actually me appearing inside a big giant ball, a big, big giant sphere that I originally designed for a concert for a Japanese pop star called Ayumi Hamazaki. Uh, so this sphere, it's a two-way mirror thing. And the sphere rises up out of the ground and there's lights on the inside and then it's, it spins around. And finally, there's this big moment and a big explosion and the thing flowers. It's a big robotic thing. And I end up appearing inside it. And I don't even know why I sent you that picture, but there you go. You didn't. I, I, I farmed this one off of your Facebook uh, page. There you go. Yep. <laughs> I couldn't trust all of the ones. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. No, I keep, I keep, I'm digging. I saw that one come up. I went, oh, this is. And partly because it, was, it wasn't obvious across the net. Even you had said, hey, I just found this photo. Right. I oh, mean, yeah. So now I'm going to do a thing. I, I f actually found about 200 photos, uh, most of those because I decided to send you a bunch of stuff. So I'm just going to start randomly posting pictures because why not? You know, I guess that's, that's our fantastic. legacy. And you know, I'm going to take a second, let everyone know that looks so much that we're talking about. Go to uh, friends, Franz uh, There's so much info and videos and, you know, I, that's I, I the put website. A, yeah, that's it. Franzerari.com. Easy to remember, but we're going to leave a whole lot where you go, but I want to know more about that. I want to know more. And it, very extensive website, just extraordinary. The, the list of credits, just, it, it just mind blowing. So I, you know, I couldn't even begin to, you know, use the accolades that would be appropriate. Um, well, but we got time. We go. If you want to more. Spend you want to spend Please. 20 minutes and go through accolades that's okay like we can yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can spend time yeah no but but while we're on the subject go to my facebook page because i'm doing something again in the spirit of taking chances this is arguably one of the stupider things i've done i call it car wash confidential and what i've done is i've taken a couple dozen of my magician friends and drove them through a car wash and interviewed them. Car wash is about seven, eight minutes. So that's all it is. But it's whatever I could get out of them during the, you know, the rinse and the, the blow dry. And uh, in fact, yesterday uh, I did uh, Joseph Gabriel, friend of yours. Uh, so he's up there right now. So go to my Facebook page and check out Car Wash Confidential along with 125 episodes of a thing called Talking Magic and quarantine talk that I did uh, really during the peak of the pandemic, right? Uh, myself and John Pullum, who I presume is watching this right now, um, we interviewed, I think, 
oh my gosh, over 150 magicians. I forget now, John could tell you. But I bet it's smiling at like 200 magicians, something like that, which was interesting because during COVID, everyone was surprisingly available. It's amazing how easily I could get to, to get people to do Zoom shows, you know? <laughs> and that's the Franz, actually on Facebook, Franz Harari fan page. There so you real go. easy. Brace slash Franz That's Harari it. fan page. Lots of info on there. Again, I, I trolled and trolled and trolled. And yeah, the 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 car wash things. What a, a surreal concept that only could yeah. be done in these strange times, as you That's said. It. You know. <laughs> That's it. My car is really clean though, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, I love it. Okay, I got one more one more picture to show you because this right. one re now the, I on the news on the Aberdot TV news um, last week I played one of your promo videos because it was oh, I looked at it, I went I, 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 I this is too cool and there was this phenomenal shot where you s hit your hand on the back of this huge uh, LCD oh, screen LED. and the whole oh, thing yeah, went yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. it just getting epic. As you talk about breaking, it creates an image of magic that no one w has done. It's, a, it's just, it's just extraordinary. Smile. So let me tell you the story about this. I don't, I don't do a card trick at all. I, in fact, I cannot do a double lift to save my life right now. Uh, but I realized that I probably should. So I came up with this card trick that's basically a pick a card. Is this your card? using the led walls that i work with so really it's just a whole lot of me pointing and it's it's all i mean meticulously timed out and designed and everything which by the way all the led work i do the design so i'm really a control freak so i'm drawing all of the graphics initially myself and then i give them to my graphics guy glenn grillo who then you know we work together and clean it up and yada 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 but this is a pick a card is this your card uh on a massive scale with a giant LED wall, also that I can avoid having to do a double lift. So that's what this is. That's the beginning of that, you know. Now I'm going to stay on this photo. I'm going to actually draw. I'm going to make it up bigger again because again. Oh, by the way, one... by the way, I'm going to Blackpool. Uh, yes, Black... you are. I was going to get gonna to that. I'm going to do Blackpool, and since I'm just going with myself and my wife and Danny Morano, buddy of mine, no team, no cargo, nothing. I'm going to do that little car trick or that big car trick uh, for Blackpool. So hopefully they've got the screen crossing my fingers. So that'll be fun. Excellent. Now I'm going to replace that. I'm going to just because this has got a couple really good quotes. Right. This one, again, this just really typified to me this this pioneer, this modern you know, uh, you've been compared to the Elon Musk of magic. I would even say the Nikola I like that Tesla. One. Well, that was my, oh, look at there. That's, that's a more yeah. intelligent. Uh, well, that's quote. what I think. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I was getting to yeah. that. But there you go. The idea of magic and science are linked together in a perpetual dance with magic propelling both forward. And this is the line. At the speed of wonder. There you go. Yeah. It's, oh. you, that was a thing. Uh, a few years ago, I did a thing for the BBC, an interview. And I find that I come up with some of my best quotes on the fly to sort of pull them out of my butt. But then I go, huh, that sounds pretty good. We'll hold on to that one. There's uh, not too much calculation that goes into it, you know. <laughs> and then the other one, as children, we believed in magic, yet the older we grow, the more our natural sense of wonder diminishes. And this is it. To me, You, it, this, again, it just it distills it. My goal is to inspire audiences to recapture their sense of childlike wonder. And to me, that's so Doug Henning, you know, we both grew up with. We wanted we, to be you know, Doug Henning. You What's came that? close. We both wanted to be Doug Henning. I know. I feel like you came a lot closer than me. Although oh. I did have the sash. I had the sash for a we, yeah, we boy, the sash. five years. Yeah. <laughs> the hippie, we came out of that. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Well, this brings us per this is just brilliant. Again, thanks. It brings us up to this sort of what I what I would say up to the now with a real very short connect the dots. This now, is this 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 is your interpretive dance segment. I've heard about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Yes, Ma yes. Magical. It really is. 
Yes. <laughs> oh, Gino told you, huh? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Let's talk. Let's look ahead. I know you've actually given us some insight that you're in Vegas for a, a current, a new project. Um, oh, you That's... know what? I can't. I can't tell you part of the project because it's a two-parter. Part okay. of the project, and and I think I can tell you this. So what the hell? I apologize to Penguin Magic if I can't, but I think I can. So I'm doing a project with Penguin Magic to design and from zero to design and develop from zero five illusions that will be specifically created for kind of the everyman magician. So these things are going to be small enough that you can, you know, put them in the back of your car. Uh, you can set them up quickly, do them with zero or very few assistants, um, hopefully do them surrounded, uh, and they're going to be cheap. I mean, really cheap. So um, they have commissioned me, and I'm working with Joaquin Ayala, my friend and, and builder right over there. I can't see right now on these things, on the first of these five. And they're going to start. I'm not sure when they're going to announce these, but, uh, you know, I'll have a levitation an appearance, a penetration, all one of every genre that will be very, very practical to use and very affordable so that everybody can kind of get their, you know, feet wet, you know, kind of jump into that, uh, into that world of illusion. And, and hopefully uh, it'll see their imagination then to go on and do the next thing. Excellent. That to me is a concept that w one of the problems I think uh, any budding illusionist uh, has to uh, surmount is simply the the, ca the cash fat. As you say, your right. first uh, illusion you had to build. All of my initial stuff that I created that you know set my name in motion, I had right. to build. I had to go to the hardware store. I right. didn't have the money to to go to right. the big illusion builder and create fog machines and all that. I had to right. as you. I had to let, figure let it out. Let me show you something. I'm in my car right now. Okay. I just I just came from a restaurant supply store because I needed to buy this, because this is the shape of something that I need that I'm working on. And I knew that I could, I knew that I've seen it in restaurants and I couldn't steal it from a restaurant. So I went to a, a restaurant place here in Vegas on my way in. So it's always about, as you know, finding bits and pieces and parts that are the right shape and right look and will service your uh what, whatever that is that you're making you know so it, that it, it was always that rounded goes on. look that was the rounded yeah, look it's, you were it's, talking. it is part of it yeah actually it is it is this is uh uh your uh veal parmesan sir but uh -huh. it's got that it's got that kind of um diesel punk thing going on so <laughs> so and it never goes on and, and i find i tr well before covid um i spent most of my year overseas Average year, I would travel about 150,000 miles just on United Airlines alone. Uh, and everywhere where I travel, everywhere, I go to hardware stores because I discover that hardware stores like Home Depot overseas have different things that you don't find in the States. And I used to just, I still do, just collect them because weird shapes and weird things, if I include them in things that I'm working on, especially to an American audience, they seem very exotic, you know, like uh, Marine, you're familiar with Marine hardware, right? Marine oh, yeah. hardware. Oh yeah. Fantastic. I grew up sailing. Oh, oh yeah. Marine hardware, expensive <laughs> as hell. A little hinge like that could be 50 bucks. The but pulleys, but the coolest pulleys. Yeah. I designed all my levitation and floating systems yep. with those pulleys because yeah, they're it. bomb proof. Yeah. That's it. They're bulletproof and they, and they're beautiful. And I've used them for so many different props. And so it's 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 kind of understanding where those resources lie and really looking at your whole world as your, uh, you know, as your flea market and and pulling shapes and, and not being afraid to, again, taking a risk and and using something non-conventional to get you where you need to be. There are no rules. You know, there are no nobody that says you need to get, you know, that one plus two equals three you know you can have a gorilla bicycle equals three it doesn't matter how you get there just get to three genius 
Wow. All right. Well, thank you. Look, we're, get, we're sort of going to wrap this up, but I want to get uh, you. You've given us a massive amount of uh, info, very exactly what I was sort of hoping this would uh, this first program would be what we've set this in motion. I really I'm the number first. One, I'm the really, first. I'm number one. You are the premier guy. I thought who is the coolest guy really? on earth I could get to start off the spotlight on programs. Uh, or, you the or man. I'm the, I'm, I'm the <laughs> guinea pig. I think I am the guinea yeah, pig. Yeah, the oh, Well, you know, I you got to take that risk. <laughs> That's right. Glad to be here with you. <laughs> hey, did we, did we thank Tim Wise yet? The reason we're doing all this is because of our friend Tim Wise. Yeah, let's, yeah, I was just going to say, let's give some little, quick little shout outs. Sub- exactly. Group. Tim Wise, go for it. Go that's it. Tim, Tim Wise. That's yeah. all I got. Tim Wise. Tim John Wise. Paul I'm going to say shout there. out to Mike Platten in Oklahoma. He's stuck with yeah. us. Uh, he's actually made a lot of comments. Austin Moody, my top student man. Talk about a up and coming. Watch this space. Austin Moody. Sharon, another student of mine from Trinidad. It's one of the coolest things. Trinidad. About- Have you been? Trinidad. I did. A, yes. I produced a concert there. Yeah. Trinidad. You know, let me tell you what I know about Trinidad. I learned so Go much for about it. that. Okay. Trinidad, I did this. Sharon's con- gonna love this. I, I designed this concert, and this would be a better story if I remembered the name of the pop star. But in the concert, they said we're gonna have dancers, and the dancers didn't show up until the actual day of the show. And what these were, I think there were six or eight women. Firstly, the people in Trinidad, beautiful people. Their their skin tone, just as dark as you can imagine. Just it's hard to explain. Just gorgeous right uh and the dancers showed up and there were probably six or eight women in their 30s maybe every one of them at least 300 pounds at least very very big women but they're wearing um you know uh they're wearing almost like a uh like a flamingo like with the headdress and the carmino barana and the and the uh, very very skimpy um kind of bikini like a showgirl, right? And at first, I I didn't understand what I was watching because here in the States, if you're a showgirl, you, were in, you, you weigh 95 pounds. Not in Trinidad. There is no specific body type that is uh, the definitive example of beauty. Every body type right across the board. And I just thought it was so wonderfully so so beautifully inclusive that they would have these very very big women out there you know dancing their asses off in their showgirl bikinis it's like wow all right and i thought i was progressive you know yeah. So that's that's what I remember about Trinidad. And I'm sure your friend will support this, you know. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cool. Well, we'll talk more about that. Uh, Gerard Costello. Will we? Uh, will we more, couple qu- What's that? Will we? Will we? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I think we will. <laughs> Gerard Costello, you got that. <laughs> Shout out Gerard Costello, Robert Blake in Holland. Uh, Tim Wise, of course, he's the monitoring hey, the channel. And thinking my mom is watching this. Hey, mom. Hey, mom. <laughs> Aaron Trod Albrecht. Um, uh, the name like that, I'm guessing Germany or somewhere, but uh, boy, you got people from around the world tuning in. And uh, John Pullum. Do we thank John Pullum? Uh, absolutely. We John, should definitely John, thank John. John. He hasn't uh, chimed in, but I'm sure he's hanging uh, out somewhere here. No, he might have gotten bored. Yeah, I probably <laughs> lost him at Michael Jackson. He probably went yeah. <laughs> this story again. Oh my gosh. Oh god. I have to go clean the litter box. Yeah. Right. Wow. Well, as I said, there's lots of uh photos to anyone who wants to wa- there's the photos of Michael Jackson. There's just all sorts of additional material. So please head over to uh Franzerari.com. Uh final words before I sort of uh say goodbye myself, Franz. Any final sort of inspirational None thoughts? None, really. Were... Inspirational thoughts? Yes. Whatever Besides you do. Besides the mayonnaise, the mystical mayonnaise principle. Because Just that, run, I, run with my, my life mantra. Whatever you do, make sure it's different and better than anything that's been done before. Go with that. Excellent. We can put, well, why don't we make up a new one? How about, don't put your lips on it. How's that? Should yeah. we close with okay. that? Yeah. Right, good. Don't you go. put your lips on it. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Yeah. 
<laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Well, have a great time. Thanks, Franz. Really appreciate your time and effort. Uh, we'll get you back on uh, hopefully as soon as we can. Oh, but we'll talk soon. Do you have yeah, one picture? Ahead. Do you have one picture of you from forty years ago? The J. Scott Berry that I saw on TV. I don't have that. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll yeah, put it up on my Facebook page and tag you so right. we can at least. Yeah, I wasn't. Perfect. This was all about you. Uh, but yes, you're oh, right. The, in my spandex. Exactly. You're right. Yes. It would have been fair to have me in my, you know, hey, first out spandex. Hey, there listen, too. <laughs> thank you for having me be a part of this, your first show. I wish you the very, very best of luck with all this and with Abra TV and the whole series. And, uh, you know, rock on. This is great. Awesome. Cheers, Franz. Have a great trip in Vegas. Lots of success. Uh, look, wish you all the best and keep creating. That's it. Keep innovating. Keep trailblazing. Keep creating. See you then. Right. Cheers. And, wow. That was as cool as I could have hoped for with Franz. That was just uh, so thank you all for watching paying attention please share this the recording will be up the facebook recording but i'll also go back and re-edit this as sort of a proper show and we'll have that up on the Aberdot TV channel. Um, now, I don't have this in front of me. Franz also has a, a channel on the Aberdot TV. I should know that by heart. But all you have to do is go to, guess what, Aberdot TV and lots and lots of stuff. We have on this program next week, uh, David Goldrake. So we got already waiting in the wings. I'm lining up grandmasters, superstars of magic. So please uh, stay tuned, pay attention uh, to what we're up to. Again, thanks to Tim Wise. Thanks to Mark Dudzik, who are all part of this major project. And look, I said all I need to say. Uh, we'll, we'll catch you on the flip side. Aberdot TV News is, of course, coming up on schedule Saturday. Lots of info on that. So we are, here we go, I go there, and I get to disappear. <laughs>